Oh, okay, folks. Um, I think it's 301. Um, probably there's going to be some more people joining, but might as well um, get started here. Welcome, everybody, to the April Interoperability and Technology ESIP Tech Dive webinar series. Um, this is our welcome if you're here for the first time, and here is our um, this is our list of talks that we've had um, going back. Uh, we have one every month on the second Thursday of the month at 3 p.m. And if you want to catch up on any of these uh, talks that we've had in the past, you can just go and watch the recordings. They're all on YouTube. And I just wanted to mention starting out that um, we've been on kind of a Jupiter uh, related Jupiter and related tools kick since back to December, back to September of 2017. And uh, probably a lot of you have seen this paper that's been being passed around from the Atlantic talking about how the scientific paper is uh, obsolete and it's sort of talking about how the scientific workflows of today are uh, probably better communicated through things like um, Jupyter notebooks and related technologies. So, um, I'm pretty happy we've been <laughs> poking away at this theme, uh, which which uh, sort of goes into reproducibility and how do you reproduce um, things when they're on the cloud and do th things effectively. And so in the context of all that, um, today's talk is about Jetstream, where actually we personally have been experimenting with a lot of um, these sort of uh, Jupiter uh, and cloud technologies. It's a great environment for doing that. And so I asked Jerem if he, Jeremy if he would give a presentation so that he can let the rest of you folks know about this resource, really nice resource for um, and free for doing work on the cloud. So um, I'm going to just turn it over to uh, Jeremy here and we cue the presenter, Jeremy. Excellent. All right. You should be good to go. Okay, there we go. So everybody can see my PowerPoint slides, I hope. Uh, Looking good. Excellent. All right, let me close the tray down there. All right, so I am Jeremy Fisher. I am the Senior Technical Advisor for Jetstream. Uh, today we're going to kind of cover what Jetstream is and what it isn't and uh, what it might be able to do for you. Um, so without further ado, uh, we're going to cover Jetstream, uh, which is the National Science Foundation's first production science and engineering cloud. Um, traditionally, for HPC funding, uh, the NSF has, has gone for more traditional HPC resources, uh, concentrating on flops. And you can see on the slides, you know, some of the things that have come along. If you're familiar with the Track 2 grants, um, these are all the Track 1 and Track 2s that have come down over the last few years. Um, so we moved from traditional HPC and then into some experimental clouds like Cloud Lab and Chameleon. Um, and now we've, we've moved into production uh, science clouds as well. And that's where you have Bridges, which is a hybrid system of HPC and cloud. And then you have Jetstream, which is a pure cloud environment. Um, so there's a lot of words on this slide, but uh, the, the too long didn't read takeaway is nobody ever has enough computing resources. Um, everybody says that they, they don't have enough resources, they always need more. Um, and in spite of that, uh, less than 2% had ever used Exceed, which is uh, the NSF's extreme digital program, uh, which is infrastructure provided by the NSF for research environments. So it comes down to the what is Jetstream and why. So like I said, uh, Jetstream is the National Science Foundation's first production science and engineering cloud. Um, one of our goals is to lower the barrier to science. Um, and, and several surveys done by Exceed and by the NSF, one of the biggest problems was the barriers to getting work done uh, were often seen as, as insurmountable by people that were not traditional HPC users. Um, so we were given the task of not just making science more accessible, but making it more accessible to more people. Um, so we've been looking at folks that have traditionally not been HPC users and trying to engage them. Um, and we're doing that by a, a ease of use and broad accessibility focus. Um, so we'll talk about the interface here in a bit, but that's, that's certainly a prime focus is trying to make it more accessible to more people. Um, we do focus on an interactive computing environment versus a more batch environment like you do with traditional HPC. 
And then uh, we really like to talk about programmable cyber infrastructure. Um, so basically using the, the underlying tools and they're more advanced tools, uh, you can truly build just about whatever you need to within reason uh, on Jetstream. And then finally, um, as Rich alluded to, reproducibility being a key, um, we provide mechanisms for people to share their VMs and then store and publish uh, for long term and getting a DOI even to publish with. Um, also, I'd like to just say if people have questions as we go, um, I've closed my little window so I can see the slides coming up. Um, but if you have a question, type it in the chat and Rich will alert me and I'll take a look. Um, but yeah, please do stop me if you have questions as we go. So the who, um, so people needing a handful of cores. Again, being a virtual machine environment, uh, you know, if you're looking for a thousand cores at a time, Jetstream probably isn't the right place for you. Um, we can point you uh, to other exceed resources and things like that that could probably be a better fit. But if you need a handful of cores, or if you need to even build a virtual cluster or some sort of infrastructure custom, it might be the right place. Um, for software developers and researchers that really need to make a custom environment, again, that programmable cyber infrastructure side of things, you really have a lot of control. Um, we'll, we'll talk on that as we go as well. But also science gateway creators, uh, for people that are not familiar with science gateways, um, again, that's another means of lowering the barrier to science where you provide a, typically a web server that has an interface to run specific workflows uh, Sometimes they provide the data set, sometimes you provide the data set, but typically uh, the user communities are well versed in what they do. Things like Galaxy, if you're familiar with that, is one. Um, there are a number of things like eDecider, which is a, an earthquake data uh, and seismic data one. Uh, but they're, they're gateways for so many different areas and they also help lower the barrier to science. So we encourage people uh, that are of that mindset and want to help other people in their research areas build, uh, build science gateways on Jetstream. And then lastly, uh, STEM educators. So something that's near and dear to my heart that I've been trying to help foster on Jetstream is using Jetstream uh, to educate in the classroom, whether it's for a course, a semester long course, or whether it's for a couple day workshop or a two week workshop or whatever. Um, Jetstream provides a great way to have a uniform environment without necessarily having to have a computer lab handy. Um, one of the biggest problems we found with a lot of universities, and especially smaller universities, is that they don't necessarily have the resources to dedicate to, uh, to doing STEM education. And Jetstream gives a way that people can use their own laptops or uh, they can use iPads or, or uh, other cheap tablets and be able to access Jetstream and do coursework on it. So it's a nice way to provide a, a uniform and stable environment for people. So what we aren't, um, we're not traditional HPC. Like I said, if you're looking for thousands and thousands of cores, uh, we are not going to be the right place for you, but that said, we'll help get you to the right place. Um, there's no shared file system. So if you're looking for Luster, you're looking for a, a, you know your giant scratch space, um, you have to start thinking more in a cloudy way. And when we say that is you start thinking about things in terms of uh, both volume storage and then object storage. Um, and we'll cover that a little bit as we go as well. Um, but it's, it's a different mindset if you're used to the HPC world. Um, the same with interconnects. Um, if you need things that are truly high throughput or things that are, are dependent on a fabric speed, uh, again, it's this, we are a cloud. So we are not looking at necessarily the highest throughput. We're looking for reliability and stability. Um, there aren't GPUs. That's a very common question. We're looking to add those. It's, it's mostly a, a funding issue at this point. So we hope to see those soon, um, but stay tuned, just like I said. And then uh, the biggest thing is, you know, people say, well, are you the same thing as Amazon or Azure or GCE? And the question is, we're similar. Uh, we provide a lot of the base services. Um, some of the places where we're different are you know, we are a, we're run by people that are used to supporting science. Um, we are geared towards science. Domain science is our focus. It's our only focus. Um, so that's one of the biggest things. And the support team behind it that is used to supporting researchers is part of that key. Um, we are also part of internet too. So we have uh, a nice fast network infrastructure connecting us. And one of the most important things to researchers are since we are an NSF funded resource, um, we are provided for researchers to do their research. Uh, you won't get a, a bill for, from us. You don't have to provide us with a credit card. 
um, what you do provide us with is a justification of why you want to use it. And to at least get started, that's a very low barrier, and I'll touch specifically on that as we go forward. Hey, Jeremy. Yes. Um, this is Rich. I think um, that the um, where you list here, there's no sh shared file system, so you have to think about how you know cloud-like ways of storing your data and and other you know cloud. You have to think cloud because you are on the cloud, and and actually that is a. Um, I think that could be an additional bullet point for who uses Jetstream on your previous slide is people who want to understand how cloud works and try to figure out analysis or scientific workflows that that work on the cloud you know so if you get something going here on Jetstream on OpenStack it would presumably work on another OpenStack system and if you did it in a cloud agnostic way it could presumably work on that same workflow could work on any of those you know as Azure uh, Amazon or GCE is that right Absolutely. No, that's a great, that's a great point is, yeah, if you're, if you're looking to do things, so we have a lot of software developers on our cloud, um, which is fantastic. And we encourage that because we want people, people that are helping develop tools for other researchers. Um, well, that, that helps, you know, the, the rising tide lifts all boats, I guess. So we definitely encourage that. And, and that would be a great use case. And I'll look at adding that for sure, Rich. Thank you very much. I, I do appreciate that. Hello. There we go. Um, so HPC versus cloud, uh, Mark II. Um, so again, adapting to a little different environment, no reservation, no queuing. Um, we are mostly an interactive environment, although uh, again, there, there are things like, uh, you know, science gateways and things like that, that are interactive in a different way. So it's other people and not the primary PI necessarily. Um, you are your own admin, which is a blessing and a curse. Um, you have root, um, and a lot of people, when they find out they have root are really excited. And I've seen it more than once where somebody gleefully shoots themselves in the foot right after that uh, um, because they get a little sudo happy. Um, but it's it's a great way to have control over your environment and over your development. Um, you really can have just about whatever you want. Um, and and I, I put some caveats with that of, you know, you, you still have to stay within your licensing. You still have to stay within you know, whatever whatever legal bounds there are. Um, and then the fact that we are not a Windows provider at this time. Um, there's no technical reason we cannot provide Windows services on Jetstream. In fact, there are some people using it from the API side, and I've actually booted Windows uh, VMs myself. Um, it's a licensing issue right now, so it's a, a legal lawyer issue that they're trying to figure out how to deal with us. <laughs> Since we are both academic and nationally funded and cross state lines, and yeah, it, it, it's no longer a clear cut thing. So the lawyers are all trying to agree, and at some point uh, that will be an offering. Cool. Um, so, again, the way of the cloud. Um, so it's more than just VMs, and it's thinking about things. You know, you think about uh, both, you know, traditional HPC, and you think about uh, even what we call enterprise computing that was just before was just computing, um, that you had very expensive uh, hardware, um, you had very cheap software, you expected the hardware to last forever. Um, and, and basically, you know, everything was, was all about the stability of the hardware. And today it's a very different world. And it's even HPC subscribes to this where hardware is often cheap and, and you plan for it to fail and throw it away and just replace it again. Um, but that is very much the way of the cloud. I mean, if you think about the commercial cloud services, you think about the private cloud, um, you know, if a, a node disappears, you just get one like it and bring it back and put it back in its place and away you go. Um, so that's, that's the way we think about it is a little differently from before. But my favorite part of thinking about the way of the cloud is thinking about VM as, as cattle, not pets. Um, now the science gateway world is a little different, but typically, um, you want to think about your VMs as they are one of many, and if something goes wrong, you can just delete it and start again. And if you've been customizing your workflows and saving your workflows in a, in a best practice sort of way, then you can always just launch another one and start back, you know, pick right back up again and start working. Um, so it's a very important thing for thinking about uh, managing your VMs and managing how you work. I don't know what that thing was, so I'm just going to move on. Um, so starting to look at what Jetstream is and how it's built. Um, so Jetstream exists of two production clouds, one at IU and one at Texas Austin. Um, 
They're 320 nodes each. Uh, there's also a smaller uh, cluster at U Arizona, which is for testing and development. Um, Arizona is our partner that develops Atmosphere, which we'll, I'll show you in a moment. Um, so they have a small cluster out there meant for uh, testing Atmosphere development on, and then also when we do upgrades to the cloud and such, they can test them there first. Um, you can see we're connected again by internet too. We also have the Exceed Net as a, a backup layer for us. And then connected internally, we're 4 by 40 inside our machine rooms. Um, a little bit, a look at the production. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time reading through these, but uh, we are a, a Dell uh, shop for Jetstream. Uh, like I said, 300 compute nodes and then uh, various other storage and management and other nodes, uh, but all provided by Dell. Um, the slides here have a little bit of information about what the nodes specifically are. Um, we'll keep moving. Uh, talking uh, a little was, bit about... that was. Sorry, that was at TAC and also at IU that you have like yes. a kind of item stuff storage? Yes, it each each site is identical. So if you if I bring back to here, um, so there's 320 nodes at each site and there's a petabyte of storage. Now that's raw storage. Um, so Ceph, uh, which is what we use for our storage servers, uh, has replication. So by the time you count replication and erasure code, it's more like about 480 uh, available. So okay. That, that's the one place that we're a little hamstrung, and, and that's unfortunately was a funding issue, is uh, when when they awarded it to two systems and not just one system, um, the place where we took the biggest hit was, was in our storage. So we're hoping to make up for that soon, um, and we've been adding a little bit of storage at, at our own expense uh, to the system, but uh, that's, yeah, that's, that's where we are today. Are you close to capacity there? Um, no, at uh, at IU we're at about sixty percent, and at TAC we're about forty percent. Okay. Uh, and then usage-wise, just overall usage of VMs, uh, IU has been sitting at about seventy percent capacity, and TAC has been at about thirty-five percent capacity. So mm -hmm. TAC is is less utilized in IU overall, and we're we're hoping to balance that out a bit. Part of that is is because something we'll talk about later with using Wrangler, um, that's kind of skewed things a little bit, but um, a lot of it is some of the early adopters just came to IU and, and that's where they settled in and that's where they're happy. So, <laughs> right. um, and, and, uh, and they're, they're starting to look at using both clouds for, uh, for fault tolerance. And again, I'm going to, I've got a slide on that as well to kind of talk about that, but most people had, didn't really think about that fault tolerance aspect of things. And now they're starting to, so mm -hmm. we'll get to that. Okay. Um, so hardware instances and flavors. Um, so if you've used one of the commercial services, you've probably run across the, the term flavors before. Um, and that's where we show here the different sizes of VMs and they're keyed by the number of CPUs. Um, and this shows how many we can put on a node. So if you have a, a, an extra, extra large uh, flavor instance, you are basically taking an entire node of Jetstream. So this, this kind of lays that out of, how much CPU, how much RAM, how much storage. Um, and we'll move on. So a little bit about the platform overview. So uh, that, that Actually, rack layout at the bottom, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, um, on the previous slide, I just had a question. Um, if you spin sure. up um, if you spin up a medium, can you, and then you decide later, oh gosh, uh, I really should have had a large or something um, for, you know, you get all your stuff going, mm -hmm. is that, is that possible to switch or is that you're sort of locked in? Well, there's there's two ways to look at that. So one, if you're in the atmosphere side of the world, which is in the, the GUI side, the more user friendly side, um, what you would want to do is you would want to make a custom image and save it. And then you could boot up on a larger instance. Um, you can't just do it in place, you know, make me a new size with this one. Sure. Um, on the API side, it is theoretically possible. Um, there is a command to do so. I have never been successful actually doing it. I've always, again, just done a snapshot and then rebooted with a larger flavor size. Okay. And it saved me far more frustration to do it that way because, like I said, I've, I've seen it done. Somebody has, you know, we've had a user say, hey, I successfully did this. Every time I try it, it seems to be fraught with, with peril. Um, okay, but you have, a, you have a method that works. Yeah, yeah, you, you can, on the, on the atmosphere side, you do a, you make a custom image, which is, literally clicking a button and filling in some metadata and then it'll 
there's a human in the loop, so it takes a little bit to run. But then you'll get a, a custom image, and you can boot that on anything larger from that at that point. And yeah. then on the on the API side, the same way, except you have full control. You do a snapshot, and then you can boot from that snapshot again. Okay. And you can you can always go larger. You can't go smaller. Is the problem? Okay. Yeah. Which may or may not be a problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You very rarely hear people say, you know, I wish I had less resources. <laughs> uh, Unless they burn but, all their account. <laughs> yeah. So the, the platform overview. Um, so those racks down at the bottom are pretty well a, a, an actual true representation of what Jetstream looks like if you saw it in the machine room. Um, so there's, uh, you know, there's five, raid, five, let's try this again in English. There are five racks of blades, and then there are two that are the storage and, and management racks. Um, sitting in the center. So we're running OpenStack on it. Ceph provides the backend storage. Um, then everything sits on top of that. So you have the exceed portion of it, and then you have the atmosphere portion. App that most people use. Um, probably, I haven't done a stat lately, but there we have 2,300 plus users presently, and there's a little over 100 API users. So the lion's share of our users come in through atmosphere. Um, and then Globus Auth sits there as a, a means of uh, authenticating for the atmosphere side of things. Um, we do have people that are coming in via OpenStack API. Um, that's something we definitely allow and encourage for advanced users. Um, there is an atmosphere API. It is in its infancy and not very well documented. So we tend to, to shy away from steering people there. Um, so to look a little bit at the atmosphere web interface, um, so the first time you log, well, the when you log into Jetstream and you get the dashboard, um, if you come in via your web browser, this is what you see. Um, so you see uh, the big three buttons at the top on, on how to get things going, launching new instances, getting help, doing settings. You see underneath it um, your resources, so your exceed allocation. Um, if I haven't touched on it, Jetstream is 100% allocated through exceed. Um, and so that way you can see where you know how much you've used so far um, you can't really see the tool tips because they won't light up since it's a powerpoint but you can actually get exact numbers of how many issues you've burned um, and on what allocation so you can see like for instance on my account i have uh, five different allocations um, and you can see each one and what you've actually burned you can see over on the right side of it how many instances you have running uh, or what state they're in how many volumes if you scroll down you can see uh, CPUs and, and RAM you've got in use. But moving on in, into Jetstream, um, if you clicked on the images, you could see our image library, and this is what we talk about with having a library of images ready for scientists, and researchers, educators to use. And they stem from uh, everything from just the base images with uh, a raw operating system and development tools added uh, to a few more specialized images, like we have a BioLinux image. Uh, we just added a genomics toolkit image. Um, we have an Intel, Intel development image for people that are doing, uh, especially doing computational work and want to do, want to use the profilers um, and also to get the most efficient code possible. Um, we have our images and then we have Galaxy images as well. So um, in addition to that, so we have the ones that are featured that we maintain and then there is literally uh, over a thousand, at last check, uh, user provided images. So these are community images where people have come to Jetstream and they've developed their own customized workflow um, and then saved a customized image and made it available for everybody. So um, that's one of the nice things about this is you have a true community where people can share uh, their workflows with each other. Um, so more of Jetstream web interface, this is what it looks like to actually launch a, an instance. Um, so you pick out your image, you basically tell it what cloud and what allocation you're using, what, how big you want it to be, and you press launch. And you wait, and it comes up. Um, this is actually seeing one that has come alive. Um, you basically can see that it is active. It, it has a real IP, um, so all Jetstream uh, VMs get a, a live IP that are, is accessible anywhere. Um, if you build things in the API, you can give it just a, an internal IP if you want to do routing that way for security or for whatever the purpose is. But from the atmosphere side, everybody gets a live IP. 
So using Jetstream VMs, um, there are a couple, like I said, a couple of different methods. The Atmosphere Web Interface is the most common. Uh, you have direct API access uh, available to you via OpenStack or Horizon Access. Um, the OpenStack command line is, is a very simple way to work. It's a very scriptable way to work, but a lot of people are not necessarily comfortable with command line. So OpenStack does have Horizon, which gives you a, a sort of gooey look into things. The difference between Horizon and Atmosphere is the, about, uh, the amount of control you get, basically. So on Horizon, you still have to build your own network. You still have to grab your own IP number. You still have to assign it. There's a lot more steps that Atmosphere just does for you. Um, you don't have to think about it. The other side of it is you have more control uh, when you go to the API side or Horizon side of things. Um, so if you're doing things that, where you truly want elastic computing, where you truly want to do uh, things that are, are out of the norm, different from just popping up a VM and doing some work, uh, coming to the API side makes a lot of sense. Um, and then actually using your VM, you can either come in, there's, a, if you come in through a, through a Atmosphere, you can use SSH inside the web browser, you can use a uh, web desktop inside the web browser, and then from outside you can use just a normal SSH client or terminal and then direct VNC as well, just depending on your preferences. So if you start up a machine on Atmosphere, can you then access it on the OpenStack side, or you got to choose that from the beginning? Uh, you choose it from the beginning. So um, Atmosphere instances are not available or not visible to the API side and vice versa, and that's on purpose. Um, there is an architectural difference in how uh, Atmosphere constructs things, and in order to keep it... Uh, safe for the moment we had to keep those two separate there will be a day when we reconstruct uh, how atmosphere builds things and will probably be more available and there's also a tool in development from a colleague at TAC that is working on a simplified uh, atmosphere CLI basically um, so you can do you'll be able to do a lot of the things using atmosphere using the atmosphere CLI that you can do from OpenStack so you would gain some of that control back but the biggest thing I tell people is if you are doing things where you need the level of control that you get with the API side, with the CLI side, um, you shouldn't be messing with Atmosphere anyway because Atmosphere makes a lot of assumptions on how things are going to be and it takes away a lot of control. Okay. Um, to look at a little bit of how Jetstream is being used. Um, so this is a snapshot from a couple months ago. Um, I did a quick pull on the top allocations, uh, the fields of science. Um, and then I compared it to how other Exceed resources overall were, were using it. Um, you'll see that uh, biological sciences are our biggest area. Um, we, we have a lot of bioinformaticians. And, and the biggest reason there is their run times tend to be longer than you can have on a traditional shared supercomputer. So they need more than 48 hours or 36 hours, whatever the max is on a lot of these. So uh, we're, we're a natural fit for them. Uh, we have a lot of computer scientists, which is again, a natural fit. Um, again, one of the things I'm proud of is we have a lot of education allocations, much higher than the rest of Exceed. Um, and then an area that's really growing for us is atmospheric sciences. I know that's gonna be a place near and dear to a lot of a lot of you, and then earth sciences as well as, as up and coming geosciences. We have a number of, uh, of folks working with us on that. Um, ocean sciences is still a very small area, but we're, we're hoping to improve that with Rich and others. So um, that's just a nice snapshot of, of where we are and, and where things are growing. Now, what is, Jeremy, what does it mean that the campus champions are actually the biggest? Um, so the campus champions, uh, I, I made it such that so, okay, let me rewind. So all the service providers for Exceed can decide if they want to give Campus Champions allocations. And what Campus Champions do, for those that are not familiar with the Exceed Campus Champions, is they are a local resource at your university or research institution, and they are the local expert on Exceed resources. Um, so a lot of times they are the people that you would ask, you know, I need more than our campus cluster can do. Um, what can Exceed do for me? They can tell you all about it. They can kind of steer you in the right direction. Um, and the other thing is they will also a lot of times let researchers use their allocations to try out a resource. And in this case, Jetstream, to see if it will work for their workflows. So I made a decision when we first started coming online that um, 
any campus champion that wanted an allocation can have one. Um, they don't have to. They don't have to ask. There's no permission. They just have to apply, and they automatically get 50,000 core hours uh, without any argument whatsoever. Not all the resources take that approach for various reasons. I mean, they have they have their reasons for it, and, and I don't fault anybody for that. I wanted to make it such that anybody, any campus champion can use the system because that in, for us is a huge resource that brings a lot of researchers to the table. Um, you know, the campus champions are more in tune with their local research, research communities. So they know who's doing what and they can help guide researchers to us and, and help bring us users. So um, that's, that's why there's such a big block. Uh, there are actually 300 uh, campus champions active right now. Um, okay. So we have, we have 123 of them have, have allocations. Um, and, and they are a very active block. And then you take some like, uh, um, I believe you're familiar with Aaron Kulich from, from Berkeley. Um, yep. He's, yeah, he's uh, one of our biggest supporters in the fact that he, he has brought us a ton of researchers that they've tried it out on his allocation, uh, you know, for a month or two and realize, hey, this really works for me. And then they come and get their own allocation. So yeah, it's, makes, it's makes a good sense, thing yeah. for everybody, in my opinion. Yep. Yeah, I mean we're we're about encouraging science. So, uh, if having campus or having campus champions have allocations uh, helps the researchers, then I am all for it. Yeah, lowers lowers the bar even further. Exactly, and that's and that's a, that's what we're about is trying to be inclusive. Yeah. Apparently, I hit my mouse. Oh, I'm using the wrong keyboard. Is why. Um, okay, so the next. Uh, Next stop on the train. Actually, actually, Jeremy, is it, is it worth point? Sure. I, I don't know if you mentioned this yet, but um, although this is targeting researchers, um, it's not exclusively in the academic domain. Um, did you mention that part? Uh, no, not really. I mean, but uh, what 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 did you have in mind in that comment? <laughs> well, um, basically, that you know, like at the USGS here, we have a campus champion, and oh, um, right, 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 and that and that folks, uh, you know, folks at federal agencies can also apply. And get oh, a start location. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It, I, I, I don't want to make it sound like only academic institutions are, are need apply. Uh, basically, any research institution is, is welcome here, um, and that's federally funded. Uh, the place we start getting into a little bit of gray area and weird area is uh, DoD and DOE stuff. Um, it's not that it's forbidden. It we just have to take a look at what you're doing and make sure we don't violate any of your agreements. So uh, NIH is absolutely fine. NSF is 100% fine. NASA is fine. Um, trying to think of, else. of course, ac you know, the academic grants and whatnot are all fine. And like I said, the only place where we run into any sort of let's make sure that we're not violating terms of your grant is, is DOD and DOE. And that's okay. usually pretty quick and pretty painless too. But yes, any research institution has to be a US-based PI. Um, we'll talk about that as we get to allocations. But yes, every everybody that's a research institution is welcome. USGS obviously is very welcome. We've got folks from USRDA. Um, non you know, so, so nonprofits. So nonprofits. Nonpro nonprofits is probably the easiest, best way to think of it. Yeah, it would, yeah. There, there are commercial entities that are allowed to use exceed resources, but there are a lot of restrictions on it. So it's something that we, you know, if we see somebody, we actually had somebody that had a Mars candy address pop up uh, in an allocation this last week. And of course that caught my eye and made me ask him, you know, what's going on. He's actually a researcher that does double duty uh, at both USRDA and Mars. Um, and all the stuff he's working on is, is a nonprofit focus and he was willing to sign an agreement as such, so it works. Um, anyway, but that's, yeah, it, it's nonprofit research science-based institutions. I, I don't know how else to qualify that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but basically, if there's any question about whether or not your institution is, is viable, just ask. I mean, uh, the odds are it is, um, but, you know, if you, have any, if you have any questions about it, we can always get you an answer pretty quickly. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, kind of lost my place here. So, jet Sorry. for engineering is <laughs> all right. No, no, questions are good. I, I just, uh, I kind of got off track, and and my brain was, I was trying to get my brain back on track, and I'm, I'm good now. Um, so, talking a little bit about jet stream for engineering, um, one of the things that we looked at right from the gate uh, was trying to engage engineers and trying to get uh, 
that community uh, that is, you know, and trying to get them onto uh, Exceed Resources. Um, one of the things that we did is we worked with uh, the MathWorks folks. Um, they made our campus licenses at TAC and at IU uh, available to Jetstream. So you can use MATLAB on Jetstream. You do not have to bring a license. Um, so MATLAB and 52 standard toolkits are covered. Uh, we do have some geosciences folks that are taking advantage of that now, um, but that is available today and at no cost. Um, again, another thing that I like to talk about is Jetstream for Education. So we've used it, we've had it seen, we've seen it used in a lot of courses. Uh, we had a couple graduate classes uh, at IU that have used it. We had a 200 user Blue Waters workshop. Um, we had uh, our first our first course that landed on Jetstream. We didn't know was coming. We had 200 users hit it simultaneously uh, one Monday. Had no idea they were coming. Um, the prof had not gotten an education allocation. They just got a startup and started using it. And we found out very quickly we could handle it. So it was a nice it was a, a, a nice surprise to know that we were prepared for hundreds of people hitting us all at once. Um, Galaxy. So uh, this might be the wrong audience for talking about Galaxy, but Galaxy is a, a uh, biomedical research platform. It's a web-based system that basically, uh, it's a science gateway for all intents and purposes, but there's two parts to, to Galaxy in, in regards to Jetstream. One is there's usegalaxy.org, which is uh, their central website, and users can come there, register, and then submit jobs, and it processes those jobs and return, returns them to the users. Um, that said, it you don't have any idea as a user where they're running. Um, a, if you fit a certain profile, you run on Jetstream. Uh, and this past year, there were 12,000 unique users that ran over 100,000 jobs on Jetstream um, via Use Galaxy. And then the other thing is the Galaxy team maintains a, an image on Jetstream. And so that way you can launch your own Galaxy instance and run your own Galaxy workflows. You can change it to your heart's content and save it and, and basically have your own custom Galaxy available to you. And that said, I've seen folks using Galaxy for more than just biomedical research. I actually had a text analyst using Galaxy just because they liked the image. So they had some R plugins and, and did some text analysis that way that they could feed it automated via website. So it's a very interesting way to do things. And as I like to say on Jetstream, we're not just usual suspects. So every, you know, everybody's seen that on big HPC systems, the high energy physicists, the molecular chemists, um, they have been using HPC for a long time. They know how to fill up a system. Um, they know how to take a system over. Um, we have a lot of folks that are very different. Uh, we've got folks that are doing financial analysis and economics. We've had several political science ones now and, and humanities tech analysis. One of the coolest things is we have a kid at IU who is uh, doing, uh, using Google Maps uh, and doing delta research for erosion and water control. And it's it's been a really interesting uh, research project to watch. So he's using that on Jetstream. Uh, but basically, as long as it, you fit in our sort of computing profile, as long as you're not needing you know, the thousands of cores, uh, Jetstream can, can offer a home for all sorts of different projects. Oops, still using the wrong keyboard. Um, so talking a little bit about gateways, um, a lot of you might be familiar with IRIS. Um, they do uh, large scale earthquake and geographical seismic data. Um, they are bringing their part of their uh, infrastructure to Jetstream. Um, so we're helping support them and, and they're entering their second year of working with Jetstream and should have it fairly well all in production soon. Um, Unidata is in the same boat. They're they're doing a lot of their analysis work on Jetstream now, um, in addition to their other resources. Um, they're also bringing a lot of Jupiter-based uh, education to Jetstream. Um, so they're using a lot of their data and they're working on having a scalable Jupiter system for folks that want to learn more about it or are researchers that want to use the data in a very simple environment. Um, so that's, I know, something that uh, we worked on with Rich a little bit and talked with others about, but it, it's a lot of the way where online instruction is moving to and online analysis is moving to just because it makes it quick and easy. Um, 
looking at open MRS, which is medical records. It is not medical data, which is something that's important to know about Jetstream is uh, protected data, uh, HIPAA data, um, basically anything that is not de-identified is not allowed on Jetstream. Um, that's not, there's no technical reason for it. It's a lawyer reason. Um, and that's typical of Exceed in general. It's not just a jet, it's not just a Jetstream issue. Um, and then a couple other gateways, um, NAMD runners, molecular dynamics, Kemp Compute is actually an educational gateway um, that is used in the classroom. Uh, and it's used for uh, both K through, well, it's high school level chemistry and then also college level chemistry for doing instructional use. So looking at the API side a little bit, we talked about Atmosphere. We talked about that it provides a very simple platform uh, for using Jetstream and for lowering the barrier to computing. The API side is a little more advanced. Um, what we bring, what we give you there is you get base images to start from. Now that said, on the API side, you have the ability to upload pretty much anything you want, as long as it can run cloud in it uh, and can talk to the cloud that way. Um, it can probably run. We have we've got all sorts of different variants of Linux. Windows users that have figured out that they can upload their own Windows images and use them. They're on their own with licensing, so that's the one caveat there. Um, so we give you a place to start. We give you a basic network space, and like I say, there's some DIY required. Um, you do have to build your network on the API side, so it's basically you define your network, you define a subnet, you define a router, and then you hook it all together. The upside to that is, uh, for basic network purposes, you do it once and you can kind of just leave it. Um, for example, I, I've built a network, uh, just a basic network for testing and such on the API side, probably the second or third month we started, and it's still there. Um, I don't tear it down because as long as there's nothing attached to it and no VMs up, there's no risk. Um, so you can kind of set it up once and, and walk away from it. Now, if you need more specialized things, then you do have to build those as you need them, but you can also leave them up and running. It's your space. Uh, you do get an IP pool to work with, um, so you do have public IPs if you need them. Uh, with the API side, when you check out a public IP, it is yours until you give it back uh, or until we force you to give it back, which we generally don't until your allocation runs out. Um, so if you check out an IP and you need it for a, a gateway, you know, a persistent service, you can do that. Um, you can assign it a DNS name from your DNS provider. Um, we have people doing that. You get a project space that's yours, um, and you get that on two clouds. So there's the IU cloud, there's the TAC cloud. So you can build on one, you can build on the other, you can build on both. Um, we have some folks that are that are building on both, and we're looking at uh, possible ways to do load balancing between them um, outside of Jetstream, but still within our project, so we would have control over it. Um, so that's something that's coming. And then we do have uh, some folks that are, are doing things on both clouds and then they have their own load balancer with elsewhere that does that that manages that um, and then like I said it's a blank canvas um, you can truly have just about anything you want as long as it is as long as it is legal um, you can bring your own license for just about anything you can uh, build just about anything you want and we've seen some very interesting things being built uh, we have a lot of elastic clustering going on now uh, where people are doing swarm clusters uh, with cloud nodes. So Swarm has now understood how to spin up and spin down nodes uh, based on your definition. So there's all sorts of interesting things going on. Um, again, uh, as I call the left twix, the right twix, um, you have the two clouds for some semblance of fault tolerance. Um, you basically can do your load distribution, performance distribution that way. Um, if you have things that figure out your closest host, they could use it on both sides and, and talk to each other and replicate as needed. A little bit about Jetstream storage. Um, so there's storage built into the VM flavors, um, and we call that the ephemeral storage. It's replicated, um, but we consider that, again, it's ephemeral. So you destroy that VM, that storage is gone. There's no getting it back. Um, so if you accidentally delete your VM uh, and you decide you want something back, sorry. Um, volume storage is the same way to a degree. I mean, it is, if you delete it, it's gone. However, uh, it's less prone to other issues. So it's persi we call it persistent because it's erasure coded. And then uh, we also have repl full replication on it. Um, 
So volumes are actually triple replicated. And so that makes that degree of safety that much better. Um, it's The system has been designed so we can lose one of anything and we're okay. So we can lose an entire storage server with an entire rack of disks and we're still up and running. Um, so that's, and that's the safety that the volume storage provides. Now, volume storage sits on top of Ceph, like I talked about before, and Ceph provides several object storage options. Um, I know that there are folks that are doing uh, various things with either HDF5 or other means of doing object storage, whether it's S3 or Swift. Um, and we give you a means to do that. Uh, we're still kind of in the early stages with it, uh, but we do have people that are using it for semi-production things. We have one uh, neuroscience gateway that uh, is actually has a number of terabytes of data being served from object store uh, routinely. So um, it's there, it's something we can talk about if you have a need. Um, it, there's gonna be a little amount of trailblazing with it, but uh, um, we do have some folks that are good resources for that in ECSS and others. Um, again, some of the uh, advanced possibilities on Jetstream. So true elastic computing. Um, and I talk about a couple things here, OpenStack Heat and OpenStack Magnum. Um, heat is actually using templates to define an environment and spin it up basically from a text file. So you tell it what you need, you define everything very specifically, and you can run a single line command and it spins things up and it'll spin up whatever you tell it to. Um, if you tell it you need five of, of this particular environment, it spins up five. Um, so it, it's a very easy way to do scripted deployments. Um, building on that is OpenStack Magnum. Uh, Magnum is container orchestration and it's built into OpenStack and now it's limited in what it orchestrates. So it, it has Apache Mesos, it has Docker Swarm and it has Kubernetes. So you can use OpenStack Magnum to script launching a, a Kubernetes cluster. Um, it, it provides again a, a, a command line scriptable way to do such things. Um, and then your own creation. And like I said, I talked a little bit about Swarm clusters and we have some people doing that where um, they spin up whatever they need based on their load. So Swarm has a definition for cloud compute and you tell it what to spin up and when to spin up and it sees, oh, I need more resources than I have for that. And it spins up what it needs. And then when it sees, oh, I don't need those anymore, it shuts them back down. And that way you're only using the amount of resources, the amount of allocation that you need at the time. And that, that leads right into the virtual clustering. Um, we've got several gateways doing it now using that Swarm method that I just described. Um, we're working on bigger and better long-term solutions. We're working on more of a, a, a means to flop out a virtual cluster on demand um, and making that easily available to folks. Uh, we do have a workshop at PERC 18 that we're gonna be uh, demonstrating some of the clustering techniques. Um, so if any of you are attending that, uh, please do feel free to join us there. Um, if not, the, if you won't be there, the materials will be online afterwards. So, um, And then other possibilities we have. So the Project Navigator lists all the OpenStack projects that are in, in progress. Um, some of the things we've been looking at for Jetstream, um, Manila was one file systems as a service, which is basically an easy way to provide a, an automated NFS server for you. Um, so it's a way to to have to serve out file systems easily. Um, so folks that don't want to necessarily be to necessarily maintain their own NSS server, this provides a way to do it automatically. Um, Sendlin, which is a Another means of, of spinning things up quickly and easily is once you do some definitions, you can curl a URL and it will spin up a, another instance for you. And one of the things that uh, Rich and I were talking about before the call, uh, doing Kubernetes clusters and doing easily easily spun up uh, Kubernetes pods, this might be something to think about with that as well. Um, Mistral, which is cron as a service, um, there's, a, there's a lot of different projects that are coming down the pike and, and we're looking at a lot of them and how we can make the Jetstream experience better all around. So big data, and of course everybody's definition of big data is very, very different. Um, to some people, big data is I have something that's a couple gig. Uh, to some people, big data is I have something that's a few terabytes. Um, to some people, it's hundreds of terabytes. It really just depends on the scale of your research. Um, so Jetstream, as we talked about a little earlier, is we are a little bit uh, limited in our storage. Um, we have plenty for everyday usage. We have plenty for 
if you need terabytes, if you start getting into 20s and 30s and 40s and hundreds of terabytes, we have to start looking at other solutions. Um, and one of the solutions we have available is kind of unique uh, in that Wrangler is another Exceed resource. Um, at IU, it is literally about four feet away from Jetstream. Uh, so we have cross-wired into their switch and vice versa. And there's dedicated NFS nodes on Wrangler that serve to Jetstream. So if you have a need, you open a ticket with us, uh, we ask you a few questions, and then we build a private VLAN just for, you, for your project to access your space on Wrangler. Um, so you can, you can have larger data sets there. Um, you can have far more storage than you could otherwise have available on Jetstream available to you. Um, the tax side is not doing that, uh, that NFS uh, solution. They are, however, uh, working on an S3 or SWIFT solution. So we hope to have that in place soon. If not, it may actually already be in beta there. Um, but that's what we're looking at on the tax side. Any questions on storage before we move on? That's usually a, a big question mark. Uh, well, you have S you have S three Swift on the IU side too, right? Yes, uh, the S well the S three Swift is on the IU cloud, and Cat Cloud has it as well. Um, as S three or Swift access uh, at TAC. Did, did, I, did I explain that? <laughs> uh, I mean, okay. Uh, I think you you have S three Swift at both TAC and IU, but in addition, you have Wrangler at no. Okay. So Jetstream, Jetstream <laughs> Cloud Storage, the object store for Jetstream, has S3 Swift access at both TAC and IU. Okay. Wrangler, which is a separate resource um, that we've worked with to provide additional storage when you have large data sets and things like that. You know, you start getting into 50 terabytes or 100 terabytes of data. Um, we recommend that you get a Wrangler allocation in addition. Um, so Wrangler at IU is available via VLAN NFS to your project space. Okay. Wrangler at TAC is available via S3 or Swift to your project space. I see. Okay. I think that I think I did a better job explaining at that time. Okay. <laughs> if there are questions about it, let me know, and we can you know we can keep talking about it. All right. But the, there's a lot of there there has been a lot of. Uh, miscommunication about is S3 available at, at TAC on Jetstream or is S3 available at IU on Jetstream. S3 and Swift for Jetstream object storage is available across the board. Okay. It's just when you yep. get to Wrangler where things get different. Okay. Okay. So uh, some usage, usage highlights. Um, as of April 1st, uh, 313 projects, um, 200 institutions, over 2,300 users. Um, one of the things that we're very, very proud about, however, is that second line, which is 86% of Jetstream users are new to Exceed. So 86% of the Jetstream users at the end of PY1 had not run on any other Exceed resource other than Jetstream, um, which means that we are hitting new users. We're hitting folks that are, are not just the usual suspects. And since that was one of our uh, our tasks from the NSF, that to me, that says we're, we're starting to hit that. Um, We've allocated 108 million CPU hours uh, since we started counting. Um, we we have about 100, 1,150 concurrent VMs as of March 2018, and that ebbs and flows just depending on things. And we're serving about 700 students directly right now with education allocations. Um, so the what comes next? Uh, we we went into full production in September of 2017. Um, so we're Still working on our first year of, of operations. Um, we are always soliciting allocation requests via Exceed. Um, we're always adding services. We're always updating Atmosphere. We basically have a five-week uh, upgrade cycle with Atmosphere. So every five weeks, we do a maintenance and uh, do bug fixes and add features. Um, getting access to Jetstream, because this is always a very important thing, is everything is 100% allocated through Exceed. However, we have things, trial allocations are available today. Now, trial allocations are a little limited. Um, there is no restriction on getting a, a trial allocation other than uh, not being in an ITAR country, um, but you can get a, a trial allocation on Exceed and 
or for Jetstream, and typically within a few hours you can be using the system. And the limitation there is you can only run two VMs per cloud, and they're the smaller VMs, so they're M1 smalls or M1 tinies. It just it, it's enough to give you a kind of sense of the interface and will this work for me. But the next step, getting a startup, is really easy. Um, you have to have a current CV, and you have to have a basically a paragraph on what you're doing, and that's it. And you can get up to 50,000 core hours to start doing uh, experimenting with your research to see if this will work for you. Um, education allocations are a little more involved, but not much. Um, again, the CV, uh, the justification, you do have to provide a syllabus for your course, and then you uh, have to do a, a resource justification of why are you asking for this many issues, and that's something that, uh, that we can work with you on. Um, so typically you can just add, you can open a, a help ticket or email me and uh, I can help you kind of figure out what you need for your class. Um, larger allocations, the research allocations are only done on a quarterly basis. Uh, we are actually in that window right now. It's open until the 15th of April. Um, typically it'll be open a week later, but they don't advertise that. Uh, they are a little more in depth. It's what I call an NSF light grant. Um, it's five to 10 pages typically, but you can get millions of core hours. Um, now, if you have a smaller allocation request, if you have, you know, 100,000 or 200,000 research requests, you can, you know, have two or three pages. It really just depends on what you need to justify your science and your dis and, and your research uh, work. So we actually have a lot of good exemplars on the Exceed site and documentation on, you know, how to go about applying. And we can also help you uh, do proofreading on your application requests and, and make sure that you get in the best position to get accepted. Um, but like for startups, again, it, it's a very, very low barrier to get on. Um, we've projected zero startups to date. Um, and that's mostly because I, I want people to be on the system using the system and trying it out. Do you have to renew the, um, Jeremy, do you have to renew that research allocation periodically or is it just until you use up all your uh, allocation? It, it's on a yearly basis. All allocations are on a yearly basis. Um, you can, with startups, and with startups, you can renew typically once. Um, we do like for people to move to research allocations. Um, partially, that's because it's a metric that the NSF measures us on, which, for better or worse, they they, they look at research allocations. Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to get them to look at just usage because that's really to be the more important thing. But uh, you have a year to do it uh, and then you can renew your research allocation or if you have a startup allocation you can move to a research allocation uh, at the next uh, application period but yeah they're all 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 allocations are good for a year and, and if you, you said it's quarterly run, yeah research allocations are quarterly okay. um, so yeah we're we're now in the uh, application period that awards on July 1 June one, okay. June one, um, and so the next the next one will open up uh, in two months, basically. But those are that's also listed on the Exceed site and in the Jetstream wiki as well. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if, when it when it comes to that time, we'll work with you. We'll help you. We'll help you get that. Yep. Okay. You have you have to do the heavy lifting of the writing, but we'll help you. We'll help you make sure that all the everything's there to give you the best chance to to get everything that you need. Yep. Okay. And of course, the where can I get help? Um, so the wiki is is the best place. Uh, it's the most up to date. Uh, we we highly recommend that as your first stop for anything Jetstream. Uh, the next thing down the line is probably the email address going to help at exceed.org. And then uh, the last two lines in there are a couple of uh, virtual workshops that our uh, colleagues at Cornell did for us. And one is on actually getting an allocation, and then one is actually just on using Jetstream. And they both have uh, some text, but they also provide uh, video segments for those that prefer to learn in that format. So you can go there and kind of see walkthroughs of, of various aspects of using Jetstream or getting a Jetstream allocation. Um, and just so you know, the these slides are available on jetstream-cloud.org on our website uh, under research, uh, the URLs at the end, but under research publications. And then these are just for fun. So we have cooling doors on Jetstream, and when everything is good, they're blue, and when things get out of sorts, they turn red. Um, we always like to joke that we're happy that the RPI never saw them red because he'd want them red all the time since I use colors. 
Um, so that's just kind of a fun thing. And then that's an even more fun thing. So this is an infrared picture of Jetstream. Uh, you can actually see the, the cooling doors towards the end there are actually cooling room air at this point. The, the system is putting more cooling out than it is applying to the cluster. When you look at the far left-hand side, um, that's actually where Wrangler is. There, Wrangler sits just across the aisle, and Wrangler is keeping our doors warm over there. So that's just kind of a fun thing to see there. Uh, this is what I like to call our NASCAR slide. So these are all of our partners. Um, obviously, Indiana Tech and Arizona are the major partners, and then we have a couple of other major funded partners. And then the fun part. Uh, so the questions. Um, and like I noticed at the top, noted at the top, the the project website is there. The project help email is there. My direct email is there. And then below, under license terms, you can actually see the URL where you can retrieve the slides if you'd like to. Uh, they are in PDF format. Um, but uh, the floor is open. All right. Well, thank you. That was um, that was a comprehensive. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> coverage of Jetstream. We have uh, minus two minutes for questions. Oh. But, uh, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, no, that's that's uh, that's fine. Um, does anybody want to um, ask Jeremy a question? Um, this is David Coyle. I'm sorry, I came in a little late. Sure. And you mentioned MATLAB. Does that mean that the user would run MATLAB on his or her desktop and then it would communicate with the cluster in the background? No, no, you actually run it on Jetstream. Okay, so, so you would launch a VM, and then uh, yeah, you'd launch uh, the. We have a MATLAB VM, um, and you would launch oh. that, and it would talk to okay. our license server and and do all okay. the, the processing on our side. And, and the beauty of that is, is that you know you can launch a 24 core instance, and I believe that's what MATLAB will let you use by default without having additional licenses. Um, and, and most people are not running. 24 core laptops or desktops so that they can get a significant increase over what they're used to using. So if you wanted to do a parallel a, a statistical, you know, off of many similar items, would, would it would, would would it just be running MATLAB's you know, uh, libraries or would it be running your your uh, other specialized libraries? Well, if you have other specialized libraries that, that you want to bring to it, you most certainly can. I mean, that's the, the beauty of Jetstream is that once you have your VM, once you have your space, it's yours to do with whatever you want. Uh, you have full control. You have root access. Oh, okay. You I can, see. Yeah. Yeah. You, you can bring anything to the table you want. Windows uh, library. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, I think so if you have, I'm sorry? That, yeah, that sounds good. Thanks. Yeah, so to, to kind of build on that, if you have a, a custom library you like, um, you would launch our MATLAB image, you would install all your stuff on it that you want for your workflows, and then you can uh, request a custom image. Uh, that's literally, you press a button that says image and give us some metadata, um, and if within a couple hours, you have a completely customized image that you can launch again and again and again, and have your workflows preserved and ready for you. Okay. I think... Um... David, there's. A, I think also you could um, you could fire up uh, like a Jupiter Jupiter Hub um, or ju just Jupiter on the cloud, and um, and then you could use your web browser as an interface to run MATLAB um, code inside the Jupiter um, environment because it um, there is a MATLAB there is the ability to run MATLAB or or R or Julia or other languages other than Python in the uh, in the Jupiter environment. Okay. Well, thanks. I don't. I don't want to take up too much time. If there's just two minutes, <laughs> thanks. Thanks. Well, I'll take as much time as people want. I just don't want to hold people if they want to go. But I, I I'm, I am here. <laughs> um, I did have. Uh, well, sorry. Does anybody else want to ask a question? <laughs> I've been asking a lot of questions. Um, um, I, I, on the, I guess on the question. You, now you said you could access Wrangler. Um, disk from TAC through S3. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that that means. So I guess I don't quite understand that because I. So on, on Wrangler you could say store like you have regular file storage right that you can NFS mount. But then it looks well, like object. Then it looks like object store or something when it's when you access it uh, from TAC. Is that what you're saying? 
Okay, so Wrangler is a, is a two-part system just like Jetstream. Um, so there's a piece of Wrangler that sits at IU and there's a piece of Wrangler that sits at TAC. Um, they're two separate systems. So they're from, from our perspective, we call them Jetstream I, or Wrangler IU and Wrangler TAC. Um, they, they, the only thing that they share in common pretty much is the name. Now they do have some data replication that happens between them, but they are two separate systems. So the IU side has as an external means to provide storage to Jetstream is, is NFS. On the tax side, uh, what they provided is is S3. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah, we, we would like for them to be uniform, but that's that's a political battle at this point. Yeah. Okay. We're working on it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, anybody else? All right. Well, um, Thank you, Jeremy, for taking the time today to explain this. Um, this is uh, I'm going to definitely pass this along to some this recording along to some other folks who uh, who have asked me questions about Jetstream because I thought it was a it's a really uh, very nice uh, coverage of of uh, at a lot of different levels and that I think a lot of people will appreciate. So um, thanks again and uh, thanks for attending the Tech Dive seminar series, folks. And we'll uh, see you again next month. Thanks again, Jeremy. Thank you all, and, and if you have questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. All righty. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Everyone.